Hey there everybody, AJ for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. As we say in my native language, G'day mate, how's it going, right? That's the story. As requested, now that my channel is a few years old, new equipment seems to be firing on all cylinders, sound levels are good, format is pretty much locked in, and it's time to go back to some of the most iconic monsters and make new, improved episodes. First on my list is one of the most recognisable and unique monsters in D&D history, the Beholder. The invention of the Beholder can be blamed on Theron Terry Kuntz, Rob Kuntz's brother, who talked about his nightmare foe in Airshot of Gary Gygax, who came up with the stats for the thing and unleashed it on his players, later publishing it officially. So, well done Terry. The Beholder was introduced with the first Dungeons and Dragons supplements, Greyhawk, in 1975 and is depicted on its cover. As you can see, the core of the design of the monster has not changed, but the style and detail, the monstrosity of them, has been greatly enhanced over the years, particularly the size of the central eye, the size and ferocity of the fanged mouth, and the detailed texture of its hide. The variability of the artistic rendering of the Beholder has become an braced by the lore of the beasts, now forming an important aspect of the ecology, but more on that later. It is generally accepted that Beholders are native lifeforms of the Far Realms, alternate realities with wildly divergent laws of physics that have a highly corruptive effect on the prime material matter, particularly lifeforms, and serve as a kind of story element that unfolds and infolds the mythos of H.P. Lovecraft into the D&D universe or multiverse, and provides a theoretical basis for psionic powers in the game, to a greater or lesser extent depending on the edition in question, particularly 4th edition. Descriptions of the Far Realms focused on how disturbing they are to the perceptions and understanding of beings from the Prime Material Plane, that everything we take for granted is thrown into question, time may be warped beyond sensibility, space and energy behave erratically, dimensional barriers are not reliable at all, and the separation between imagination and reality breaks down. Thoughts can become living entities. Anything can merge with consciousness. There is uh, also vast formless voids in which impossibly old intelligences slumber. Beings that are said to form whole prime universes in their dreams and these manifest in real space. The inhabitants of these realities are totally alien in their psychology, physiology and perceptions. And if and when they do interact with or actually inhabit the prime material plane, they don't really make sense compared to native living creatures. They seem horrific, monstrous, alien, supernatural, chaotic, repulsive. They can disrupt and corrupt everything around them. And while they, those who seek unrestrained power, particularly the power of transformation and raw energy, the magic users and the agents of chaos seek them out with a dangerous fascination, Everyone else is the universal in the universal agreement that these aberrations must be destroyed whenever and however they are encountered. There are a rare few of these aberrant creatures, however, who have become almost naturalized to the prime material plane. One of these is the Beholder. They can be found on the world of Eberron, where Beholders served as living artillery during the Delkir invasion or incursion, using the terrible power of their rays. Uh, I raised to scatter whole goblin armies. In Eberron, Beholders do not have a culture of their own. They are simply the immortal servants of the Delkir. Most continue to serve their masters, commanding subterranean outposts of aberrations or serving as the hidden leaders of various cults of the dragon below. Others lead solitary lives, contemplating mysteries or studying the world. Such lone Beholders may manipulate humanoid communities, as we see quite often in Beholder activity. Members of the cults of the dragon below believe that these creatures function as the eyes of the greater power. Some insist that they serve uh, Balashira and powerful Delkir, who is known as the Lord of Eyes. Others claim the beholders are the eyes of Zoriat itself, that while they serve the Delkir, they are conduits of power even greater and more terrible than the shapers of flesh. In the Spelljammer setting, Beholders would be dire threats to all other civilizations with their abundant magical powers and perhaps the most formidable warrior race of the universe, but fortunately they are too busy slaughtering one another to present a serious threat to other spacefaring races. In this regard, I'm always reminded of the Dalek species from Doctor Who television series, a race so xenophobic that the hatred of others extends even to their own racial variations, such that Beholders are permanently engaged in an intense civil war of genetic purity. There are a large number of variations in the Beholder race, with sub races having um, some having smooth hides, others ch uh, chitinous plates, others notable differences include snake-like eye stalks or crustacean-like eye stalks, um, joints and things. Some variations seem minor, such as variations in the size of the central eye or differences in skin color. Each Beholder nation believes itself to be the true Beholder race and sees other Beholders as ugly copies that must be destroyed. 
Lone beholders in wild space often uh, refugees who have survived an attack or been um, that exterminated the rest of their nest and are outcasts who ex were expelled for some form of mutation. And the most famous lone beholder is a large, uh, large Luigi who works as a barkeeper in the Rock of Brawl. Beholders use a large number of different ship designs in Spelljammer. Some of these ships feature a piercing ram, but others have no weaponry. All beholder ships allow a conduit of beholders to focus their eye stalks into a 400 yard beam of magical energy. These ships are powered and navigated by the Orbis or the Orbi uh, race of beholders who are stunted albino and very weak in combat. In the Forgotten Realms, the world of Abiatoral is home to a large number of Beholders who make themselves at home throughout the Underdark. The Beholders infiltrate and seek to control many sectors of society. A large number of Beholders are allied to the Zentarum. Some work with the Red Wizards of Thay, and a particularly powerful Beholder known as the Eye, or Xanathar, controls Skelpwort's influential Xanathar Thieves Guild underneath Waterdeep. Beholders uh, also compete for control of the Underdark from where most of them originate, with the base of power in the City of the Eye Torrents, Ultol. Fifth edition of the game has clarified exactly why there is so much variation in paranoia within the Beholder species, and I'm particularly happy with the exploitation as it's so outlandish and weird, particularly perfect for creatures from the Far Realm, and I will talk about this in just a moment. The basic biology and structure of the Beholder is best represented by the Eye Tyrant species. This is what I consider to be the common or baseline Beholder, or, and I hesitate to use the word, the normal Beholder. Although Beholders might look like relatively simple creatures, some of their features and internal organs are wholly unique to these terrible monstrosities. Beholder consists of a single sphere, about 8 feet wide, but it's not unusual for a specimen to be slightly smaller or even larger. Their natural buoyancy cuts down on this weight somewhat, but their bodies are still dense and compact. An 8 foot diameter Beholder weighs anywhere between 4,000 and 5,000 pounds. That's around the maximum load your average horse-drawn wagon uh, wooden cart can handle before a wheel pops off, and certainly would require something like that to even move the beast if it were going to take it back to town as a horrific trophy. That's assuming that their uh, buoyancy ceases when the beholder dies. I'm not entirely sure it does. A beholder's skin has the strength of steel. Apart from the specialized skin of the eyelids, lips, eye stalks, and along the jaws, beholder skin is essentially inflexible. Coloration and texture varies widely from one beholder to the next. Some beholders have smooth, almost shiny skin of a single drab color, while others have brightly cut or even striped or spotted skin that seems to be comprised of thick, bony interlocking plates, chitin, lumps, horns, even patches of fur. Each beholder thinks of itself as the true form spawned eons ago by the Great Mother, and any variations exhibited by other beholders are taken as marks of inferiority. The flesh of a beholder's eye stalks is tough and fibrous, but unlike the skin that covers its body, the skin is quite flexible. On most beholders, each eye stalk is smooth and rubbery, almost like a tentacle. Again, there's much variation. Some beholders have had segmented eye stalks similar to a worm's body, while others have articulated almost insect-like stalks comprised of numerous uh, knuckles and digits that rotate and bend in any direct, given direction. Beholder's mouth performs the same function as a human's mouth. It has a tongue, soft upper and lower palates, and upper and lower teeth. Beholder's teeth are long, tapering, and sharp fangs designed for ripping and tearing. They have a grossly large maw that can barely close around the excessively proportioned, somewhat jumbled, simple leaf teeth. Or they can have a mouth that is more like a wide, flexible zipper with a more or less even row of interlocking fangs. Uh, they don't have any appreciable sense of taste. Beholders' non-visual sensory organs are not quite as acute as a human's. Their sense of touch has atrophied nearly to the point of uselessness, except for the surface of the tongue, eyelids, and other softer, more pliable areas. And they don't feel much of anything. If ambient conditions are not obvious or damaging, they may not even notice a room is stifling hot, very cold, or something invisible is touching them. Beholders use their tongue to touch objects and manipulate them with a fine degree of control. Since this fleshy muscle is quite sensitive, it has no sense of taste, but as much, um, which is why they just eat just about anything. They eat mainly for esoteric reasons or their desire to have something. Beholders use their, um, they can detect scents through thousands of minuscule openings called spiracles all over the surface of their bodies. And it's through these openings that they also breathe. Um, of the four non-visual senses, only Beholder's hearing approaches that of a human's. Their eyes, Beholders typically have 10 eye stalks and one central eye. If destroyed, such as being hacked off with a bladed weapon, they'll grow back in about a week. 
which is quite an accomplishment. In addition to providing the beholder with true 360 degree vision, the eyes can be used to aim, direct and emit powerful magical rays. Beholder's eyeball is remarkably hard and solid, about as strong as a similarly sized ball of stone. Not granite, but much harder than you would expect. While at the rest, um, at rest, the eyes have a round, brilliantly coloured iris. The iris seems to be some sort of translucent crystal consisting of hundreds of interlocking sheaths, each of which is capable of independent movement. This allows the beholder amazing control over the shape of its uh, iris and the amount of light that it's allowed to enter its eye. It can adjust its iris to almost any shape imaginable, can even expand it to the rim of its eye socket just to give the appearance of no iris at all. Curiously, a beholder's eye doesn't have a single lens. Rather, each um, eye can have many different, or as much as many as a diff dozen different sized and shaped lenses, all capable of independent rotation and movement, and linked to the movement of its iris. By adjusting these lenses and iris, the beholder can aim its eye ray, and the numerous lenses have added benefit of granting the creature exceptional vision. All beholders possess dark vision out to 120 feet, and in brightly lit conditions, can count the legs on a mosquito at over twice this distance. The interior of the beholder's eye is a tangled mess of transparent, nearly invisible strands of nervous tissue called uh, evocularies. Each evocularia uh, feeds directly into the eye's three retinas and anchors an iris sheath, a lens, or both. And the evocularies not only aid in the movement of the various components, but also transmit light and magical energy from the retinas to the lens and vice versa. Each eye has a slightly different configuration of evocularies. In one eye, they might form a complex spiral. In another, they might form a tightly wound corkscrew patterns. In a third, they might be taut and straight. The nature of the eye's evocularie configuration is believed to be what focuses the, the raw magical energy the creature generates deep within its brain to create the sing, uh, signature eye ray effects. The three retinas of each eye coil into a tightly complex braid-like structure that wind down the stalk or up into the central eye uh, to converge deep inside the creature's body and brain. The raw magical energy that powers the beholder's eye rays is transmitted along the braid from the duama lobes of its brain. So it's got magical generation organs that are quite mysterious. Its internal anatomy, um, beholder's outer body, although strange, at least seems logical in construction, the further one gets into the innards of a beholder, however, the more alien and unusual the components become. Its internal organs are tangled, brightly coloured, often inscrutable mass of tubes, sacs, coils and things that have little or no analogy to those found in a human. Sages have managed to pin down the purpose of some of these organs by the process of elimination or by their proximity to the creature's mouth. A beholder's digestive system and its connected circulatory and respiratory systems is fairly obvious. Behind these, well, they have a large brain and some other stuff. Perhaps the most unusual shared feature of Beholder's internal organs is their freakish buoyancy. Even when separated from the remainder of the body, these organs float like balloons, despite the fact that they rarely contain any appreciable volumes of air or natural gas, with the exception of the lung itself. An internal organ separated from a Beholder's body retains this buoyancy for up to 12 hours or longer if preserved by magic like gentle repose. This natural buoyancy allows the beholder to fly, and its motions and movements partly are controlled by jets of air or liquid expelled from thousands of those spiracles, or by some almost magnetic action between the organs, which creates an invisible motive force. Beholders can move quickly when they plummet down towards a source of gravity, otherwise they scoot around at 20 feet per round with a fair degree of agility. Their skeletal system, technically beholders are endoskeletal creatures, though they uh, what passes for a skeleton in their bodies amounts to nothing more than a large skull uh, with or without a jawbone. Um, and that skull is not really bone, but it's a couple of layers of porous lightweight, um, almost as hard as iron material, quickly turning into um, a brittle substance after the creature dies. Those who manage to preserve um, it do so mostly to keep the, it as a trophy, as it's um, a waste to fashion it into armor because it's not very effective. The vascular and digestive system, a most readily obvious set of internal organs that make up the creature's digestive tract, and the back of the beholder's mouth consists of a powerful sphincter-like muscle opening into a short esophagus and into a large flat stomach that fills most of the hollow inside the lower jaw. Numerous smaller tubes are, and that are similar to the intestines branch off from the stomach to coil up into the back of the creature. As they continue to split, they carry the liquefied remains of a meal further up into its body. 
Eventually these intestines become as thin as hairs and they coil around and through the large fan shaped organ that contains hundreds of tiny air filled channels. This is the beholder's lung and the channels consistently mix with air and the digested food to produce a froth frothy pink fluid. And the lung itself is lined with powerful muscles that expand and contract rhythmically, drawing in and expelling air from the spiral cores of the beholder's skin. And it need not be air that the beholder takes in. They can exist quite comfortably in water if they're adapted to it. From the lung, hundreds of thousands of these uh, fine arteries branch out to deliver the fluid mixture to the other organs. This runny material is pumped through the creature's body by the propulsion of a lung, and once the nutrients and oxygen provided by the fluid are completely consumed, the waste liquid drains back into the beholder's cavernous maw. It is then expelled, or more often it just drools and dribbles out in a constant stream of foul-smelling drool. The beholder that goes without food grows more lethargic as the bodies begin to, to dry out. And they don't grow fat, they, they tend to just grow cysts of greasy nutrient goop. This can form lumps, blisters, vein-like growths, warts, and what looks like pus-filled boils. Beholders may eat only as much as they require or be ravenous gluttons, it really comes down to personality. Anything a beholder finds indigestible is either vomited back out or it's um, and spat out or slowly absorbed into the lining of the creature's stomach and eventually embedded in the inside surface of its skeleton. The central nervous system is a beholder's intense magical power and energy are gathered and directed in the internal organs that comprise the nervous system and brain. Some theorize that beholders gather magical energy from the bodies of spellcasting creatures they've eaten, while others believe that they simply absorb magical energy from their environment, which I think is true. I think the uh, central eye ray is actually drinking in energy from around them, and it's not so much a projected ray of anti-magic, but it's an actual feeding cone that drains all supernatural forces around them. In fact, a beholder's vast store of magical power is directly connected to its eyes, just as the creature's braided optic nerves transmit light from the bright uh, brain to allow sight, uh, so do the eyes transmit magic from the brain for storage and augmentation. A beholder can absorb magical energy by looking at spell effects in action, by observing magical creatures like constructs or spellcasters, by gazing upon ancient relics or minor and magical baubles, and by simply reading or studying. So, spell books. It can even uh, absorb magic from watching its own eye rays, recycling the power back into its brain as it uses them, so it's quite energy efficient really. The amount of magical energy the eyes absorb is minuscule. A beholder can study the same magic missile scroll non-stop for months before the study would render the scroll useless. The more powerful and uh, permanent the magic is, the longer it takes to absorb. Further, beholders build up tolerances to magic of some variety. A beholder would gain much less magical energy from studying a single pair of winged boots over the course of a week than it would from studying an entire library full of arcane tomes. A beholder that goes without a study, steady supply of magic to study grows cantankerous and paranoid. More than any sense of greed, this forces the creature to hoard magic items as treasure and to seek out ruins, dungeons, and other repositories of powerful magic, which is why they're drawn to the Zentarum and the Red Wizards of Thay. A beholder's brain is quite large. Much of it consists of two lobes that descend down into the left and right horns. These are known as Duema lobes. It is here that magical energy is stored and amplified. It's a dangerous organ to study unprepared. There is speculation and theory about the way beholders think and perceive reality due to the unique structure of the brain lobes. Unlike a humanoid, the beholder's brain consists of many clusters and with a very complex arrangement between the largely autonomous visual subcortex, clumps, uh, attached to each eye stalk. The beholder doesn't have to consciously choose where to look, and sounds and motions in their environment will automatically draw the attention of one or more of the eye stalks, even when the beholder is sleeping. When they, they would peer around and react to things going on nearby, rousing the beholder from slumber if they detect a threat. The combined visual input of 11 eyes is enormous, so the cluster's mind will uh, filter and analyze this information before passing it through to the central cortex mind. This, that stores most of the memory of the beholder. So it's kind of like their subconscious is reversed to ours. Ours is an internal thing, theirs is an external thing, and it filters uh, a much more complex relationship between the two.
Uh, they have a reactive, predatory, and cunning mind that deals with all their senses, but is detached from meaning, nuance, and sentiment. To this reactive sensory mind, everything is dealt with in the present. His instincts are acted on immediately. The core, subjective mind is more analytical, emotional, obsessive, introspective, and completely self-absorbed. Much like a human, beholders have internal conversations, constantly imagine different possible scenarios and outcomes, have goals, fears, aspirations, and vanity. Unlike a human, the self-regard of a beholder is enormous and unshakable. They are simply obsessed with themselves. Their own goals are all that matter to them. They are, basically, psychopaths. I've likened the mind of a typical beholder to almost exactly like the villainous Daleks from Doctor Who TV series. These mutant creatures were deliberately engineered to be the most aggressive xenophobic species in existence, sealing themselves inside nigh impregnable cybernetic war machines, completely obsessed with their own view that they are the perfect organisms and that all inferior organisms must die, even to the point that where they would destroy the universe if it meant that only they survived and all other species were annihilated. Beholders are not that extreme, but it would not take much of a push to get them thinking along those lines. They do each consider consider themselves to be the model of beholder perfection, and they are not at all hesitant to say so. They understand the concept of modesty as it applies to inferior creatures, but of course they are not burdened by such a thing. The beholder's lair is a reflection of its personality and attitude. They typically seek out a series of interlinked caves or caverns that they can further enhance sculpt with their various eye rays, telekinesis and disintegration, cut and mould the environment, hollowing out a series of chambers connected with shafts that are snug fit for the boulder's floating body. The patterns carved into the walls and surfaces will reflect the general style of the boulder's own body, of course with tentacle eye stalks represented by swirls and loops on the walls, lines and patterns representing eye rays, zigzag edges representing fangs and so on. They will have a trophy room, objects perched on high shelves, pillars and plinths, each out of reach of their ground crawling minions that or would be thieves. They have no need to touch the floor themselves, but they ensure it is a deadly gauntlet of traps, alarms and hazards. They may favour spotlessly clean areas or live in sparkling finery perched over squalid filth. They may uh, design looping and confusing passages, particularly any escape shaft they construct so as to prevent anything getting a clear shot at them as they flee, while ensuring that they can wait and ambush pursuers any, um, that round any of the many twists and bends. They love it when humanoids fall down pits and trapdoors, and they also love to decorate their lairs with the petrified remains of former servants or foes, a grim reminder that contending with them is certain death. You can also be, uh, they can also be whimsical, oddball, very creative and constructive in their traps and features in their lairs and at fairly enormous effort designing them just to amuse themselves for the sake of uh, the lesser creatures that uh, interlope. Me more than one outlandish madhouse dungeon has been constructed by beholders just for their own entertainment and reputation, which explains a lot about the Dungeons and Dragons world. I mean, because that influences the architectural styles of other creatures that encounter these places. Their larger-than-life personalities and quirks often lend itself to obsessive and bizarre collections. They can fill chambers with hoarded coins from around the world, or a collection of all kinds of ship anchors. They may keep a menagerie of exotic pets, or engage in grisly experimentation of an alchemical or arcane nature. For example, whoever said that owl bears were the result of humanoid wizards' crazy experiments? Hmm? Beholders also quite fascinated with other beholders. They most certainly will neutralize and vivisect another beholder just to see what it looks like on the inside, simply because they're curious about themselves. Their narcissism trumps their empathy for any other creature, and beholders have no affection for other beholders though they do respect the threat that they pose to each other. Their earlier, their reproduction is quite interesting. In earlier editions, uh, beholders were known to have no gender. They reproduced by growing a mass at the base of their tongue, which swelled with uh, filled, fluid-filled growths containing infant beholders. When the mass grew to a sufficient size, the beholder vomited up the mass, which floated in the air, dripping foul liquor, and the young beholders chewed their way out of the gross mass and took off in the nearest exit or hiding place. Any who lingered would meet a swift and cruel end by their siblings or their own parent. In the latest edition, we learn that beholders can reproduce by dream manifestation. This is brilliant. The magical power of the beholder is such that when locked in a particularly intense internal fantasy or nightmare, they can spontaneously create a new, fully formed beholder out of nowhere. This certainly amounts for, accounts for the wild variability evident in the species, and for the fact that new beholders keep being born despite individual complete intolerance for each other. 
The exception is the Hive Mother variant. Uh, these beholders have powers of psychic dominance that are sufficient to overcome the resistance of other beholders and they form colonies or hives of beholders. Quite a few beholders who share a similar appearance don't mind working in closer proximity to others of their breed, such as those who operate in Thay or within the Zentarum. You'll find that they tend to look quite similar to each other. Beholders often establish themselves in, as the dominant head of an underground organisation, often literally underground, such as Xanathar of Waterdeep, who rules over a powerful thieves' guild. The Xanathar is a classic example of a more cosmopolitan, tolerant and urbane beholder with a quirky sense of humour and a fondness for collecting magical items, art and goldfish. In combat, beholders are infamous monsters to face in combat. They're highly mobile, very intelligent, will stack the situation very much in their favour They have, um, if they have the opportunity to do so. They assume that an attack will arrive at any time and occupy a lot of their time preparing for any potential threat. They hoard magical items that they can uh, make use of, such as alchemical flasks, iron stones, potions, amulets, horns, mirrors, and feel free to make unique new items that will be exclusive to beholders, such as intelligent artificial fangs that can function the same as magical wands, or large bands for the eye stalks that function like magical rings. They're also known to employ magical lenses to enhance their eye rays. The lens of rake chaining um, allows a beholder to bounce a lens, uh, a right eye ray from one target to another. Lens of eye doubling splits the ray and, and it can hit two targets simultaneously. And the lens of ray widening turns a ray into a cone, although the saving throw is much lower though. They cultivate completely expendable and fanatical minions that they can put between themselves and any danger. They will also use clever tactics such as retreating and collapsing tunnels to funnel combat down into a deadly choke point or put adventurers on lower levels while archers rain down death on them from above, such as what they would do. But of course, the main threat of a beholder is their power to sh uh, shoot beams from their eyes. Not all their eye stalks can focus in one direction, so they work well against multiple targets that surround them, a target-rich environment. The exact type of beam per eye stalk is variable, as is their appearance, but typically they will be able to fire off disintegration, sleep, petrification, death, charm, paralysis, fear, a slowing beam, innovation or negative energy, and telekinesis. The beholder shoots three eye rays per round, and the eye rays are determined randomly, just for extra fun. They're large, or, although of course if the adventurers aren't moving around and the beholders not moving around, don't vary up um, that that spread of uh, eye stalks too much because it represents that some of those eye stalks can't reach around the body to see in that particular direction. Perhaps. Their, la <coughs> Excuse me. Their large central eye projects a faint grey cone of anti-magic that's only visible to very in very rare instances. Most people can't see the beam, but certainly observe the effect. The range is 150 feet, though it hits like a spotlight, creating an anti-magic zone 10 feet across that negates all magic, including the beholder's own eye rays, but it will not disrupt another beholder's ability to hover. The hovering flight of a beholder has no altitude limit, by the way. They can fly out into space if they wanted to. Beholders will typically hover well out of melee range, at a maximum range of their eye rays and anti-magic cone, focus it on any spellcaster who threatens them, while they lay down a blistering barrage of rays on any foe that they can detect. More experienced beholders will pick up one target creature with their telekinesis ray, lift it directly above them and focus twice as many eye beams on that target. This seems pretty unfair, but if I were a beholder, that's certainly what I would do. They can also set off effects in their lair as opportunity arises, such as collapsing the roof or hurling objects around to create difficult terrain. Feel free to be very creative with the way that beholders use their petrification beam. For instance, they can petrify water. If you're standing in a puddle and they petrify the water, it will turn to stone. Interesting. Lifespan of beholders, they can, uh, they can and do embrace becoming undead when they reach the end of their lifespan, which varies a lot, but it's no less than uh, 225 years unless they meet a violent end. Some will say that uh, beholders don't live for more than 100 years, that's not true. They subsist mostly on raw meat, but can eat mostly uh, most organic material in a pinch. Beholders love to eat rodents, roast beef and flower petals. They enjoy wine and blood. They hate hard-boiled eggs, and they won't eat eyes. Just, they just don't. Older beholders may suffer from one of several diseases unique to their kind, which are spasms, or dioher, 
these begin to uh, the beholders begin to lose their mental coherence and levitate in random directions. It's just, they basically just jitter around in the air. Mania or etorak. They manifest violent mood swings and think of all creatures as mutant, hideous, rival beholders, which is an interesting uh, mental affliction. Meat rot, or melohur, this is a type of food poisoning. They gain pustules and blisters on their skin. The history of beholders, um, they worship the great mother who first, uh, whose, whose firstborn was named Ksamnal. Ksamnal gave birth to the immortal ancestors of the beholder race and instructed them to gather knowledge and um, spread. And some beholders, known as the traitors, spawned beholder kin that did not, did not resemble the Great Mother. This sparked a genocidal war among other beholders, which continues to this day. So they have various reasons why they hate each other. The Great Mother is a giant beholder that travels the lower plains. She's devoid of any logic. She devours creatures in her endless journey and lays eggs, spawning beholder variants. The beholder variants are a complex lot there's i mean there's been a lot of beholders over the years because this has become one of the the central focuses of new beholders popping up all the time and i'm of the personal philosophy uh, that you should always throw something unusual at the players when they're encountering a beholder no beholders should ever be exactly the same so to speak the death kiss beholder this is a beholder can has no mouth and its eye stalks are actually tentacles with hooks it feeds by attaching tentacles to a victim and draining its blood this is for beholders who have uh, nightmares about being vampires eyes of the deep are water breathing crab pincer equipped beholders that shoot cones of blinding light from their eyes and each of the deep uh, eye of the deep has two tentacles which create illusions and hold people and monsters the Gwath, um, this beholder can feeds on magic, it can fire off different spells, and it can drain charges from magical items. It actually eats magical items. In 4th edition, beholders had a special sack inside their body which contained residuum, so it was actual physical manifestation of magical power that spell users could use uh, in lieu of components to cast any spell. The spectator is a guardian of places and treasures. The central eye can reflect spells back at the caster, and spectators are summoned from Nirvana and actually quite friendly. They're, they're a friendly variant from another plane of existence. The undead beholder, or the death tyrant, are nightmarish creatures. These abominations have milky films covering their eyes. They are slow and strike last in every combat. They are mindless servants of powerful masters. And, yeah, terrifying. And probably really stinky. The Hive Mother is the, uh, they call them the ultimate tyrants, they are twice the size of a normal beholder. They can swallow people whole on a critical bite, and a Hive Mother has no eye stalks, the eyes are embedded in the creature's hide with hooded covers. They control other beholders, usually uh, 5 or 10 normal beholders will surround them, or 20 beholder kin, so they are a central node in a battalion of just devastation. The director is an insect-like beholder kin breed specially uh, created to be mounts. This mount is usually a centipede spider type of creature. The examiner are scholars and clerks who study magical items, so they're largely uninterested in other creatures. They're just obsessed with the collection and cataloging of magic. The lensman, um, this thing actually has a humanoid body instead of its head. It is a whip-like tentacles. That's, that's very weird. The Overseer, uh, they, they're like fleshy trees with 13 limbs, each of which has an eye stalk. The Watcher are large um, eyes, and they have them all around their body. They have True Sight, ESP, and can teleport. The Beholder Mage, uh, they've blinded their central eye so that they can cast more spells, which is an interesting variant. They've, they've fashioned themselves into wizards. The Elder Orb are ancient Beholders with enormous intelligence um, they've somehow stumbled across, across a way of extending their lifespan significantly probably through the study of necromancy uh, the orbis which i mentioned before the orbi a pale white beholder with great magical ability these are from the spell jammer setting and pilot their vehicles uh, basically like guild navigators from dune the gas spore these things look like beholders but are actually gas filled sacks possibly infected by a specific type of fungus the Doom Sphere is a ghost beholder created by magical explosions. The Kasharan is an undead beholder that can pass on a rotting disease. The Asterita is a beholder-like, a boulder-like beholder without eyes. Um, 
And I came up with a variant called a Mind's Eye Beholder, which has an anti-psychic uh, beam and lots of telekinetic charm and dominance or maddening rays. And the Eye of Flame, uh, quite famous. These beholders are more powerful beholders. They fire eye rays that are um, all fire-based and they're telekinesis rays and fear rays as well. When they die, they explode in a fire burst. The Beholder Spawn... These are 4th edition minions, so they have a single hit point, they fire a single eye ray that does 11 points of damage in a, of a single type, so like just fire or force or lightning. Um, you got to love those minions. The Eyes of Shadow, finally. These uh, beholders spend too much time in the shadow fell, and it's eye rays that blind do thunder damage and mobilize, and they can teleport and become invisible. Uh, some consider the Gorbel to be a type of beholder kin. I made a video on these critters, and I'm not certain the two monster types are related, but, I mean, they're still spherical and sort of gas-filled, but the um, the Gorbels just run around and then explode the moment they get pierced. And that's about it for the Boulder. They really are quite unique, and certainly in the top 10 of most iconic Dungeons & Dragons deadly foes, while still being very well enough to serve a more story-based function as an explorer um, adventurer's patron or other quirky freaky non-player character they can be encountered anywhere and they can be engaged in almost any kind of activity and they always always give players the heebie-jeebies when you plonk their miniature down on the tabletop and hold up a picture and, or hold up a picture and say you see this thing it always gives them a, a moment to pause and go right what have we got we got to think they basically bring everything they have to the table when they're in a fight with a beholder as you should all right everybody that's uh that's it for the beholder thank you very much for listening i'll be back again soon